Hello, I am Paul Harris, America's editor at Mining Journal, and welcome to this insight panel about copper. Joining me today, we have a mixed and varied panel um, with Stefan Ianen, Institutional Equity Research Based Metals at Cormark Securities, Alex Sukunik, President and CEO of Nova Royalty, Jay Simulaskus, CEO, President and CEO of Camino, Eric Sanderholm, President of American Pacific, and Matt McKenzie, Vice President at Midnight Sun Mining. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Let's start off. Let's take a minute. Um, please uh, tell everybody who you are and what you do. Uh, let's start with Stefan, please. Okay, great. I'm Stefan Ioano. I'm a base metals analyst at Cormark Securities in Toronto. Uh, again, specializing in base metals. And I guess just a little bit back, background on me is I, I started off my journey with a, a mining engineering degree. I went on to work actually as an exploration geologist in, in Nevada and throughout the Canadian Shield for several years. Uh, and then actually migrated back to academics, did a PhD in economic geology, uh, and then pivoted again, actually, through some contacts, ended up on Bay Street uh, as, a, as an analyst, focusing on base metals for the better part of the last 20 years, uh, most recently now with Cormark for about four years. Excellent. Thank you, Stefan. Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, great. Uh, th thank you for, ha for having me be here. Um, I'm, I'm the co-founder and uh, CEO of Nova Royalty. We're, we're a royalty company focused on copper. Um, and nickel. So we put that together in 2018 because we figured that's where the world was going to go with the energy transition. And these are really the top two commodities. Um, so, you know, we own the royalties and some of the largest copper de deposits out there on the development side. And we're excited for what's to come in the sector. Yeah. And you've been very active recently. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jay, a little bit about yourself, please. Yeah, so CEO of Camino Corporation, I uh, started my career uh, in Papua New Guinea at uh, the Progra Gold Mine, recognizing that the gold price had to uh, move back in 1999-2000. Uh, so I got behind a company called uh, China, well, uh, Jinshan Gold Mines. Uh, we developed China's second largest gold mine, uh, uh, which is now China Gold uh, International. And I guess the, the, the theme here is that I get behind uh, you know, commodities uh, that I think will have uh, a move uh, for one, uh, you know, fundamental reason or another. Uh, after that, it was uh, Western Lithium uh, in 2008, one of the first uh, person, you know, groups into the, the lithium space uh, and developed that project uh, by acquiring uh, lithium. We had a project in Nevada, uh, which is now called Thacker Pass, acquired Lithium Americas in 2015. Uh, and that's one of the leading uh, lithium development companies now uh, in the world. Uh, and so here I am today uh, in front of uh, the copper market. Uh, I think we've got uh, a 10 year uh, or longer cycle uh, for electrification. And so we're building a portfolio of exploration assets uh, in Camino Corporation to take advantage of this, uh, this copper team. Thank you very much, Jay. Eric, over to you, please. Uh, but I've been in, <clears throat> been in the exploration and mining business, uh, mainly gold and copper and silver for about 40 years now. I uh, worked for Newmont for many, many years as an exploration manager for the Western U.S. Uh, I'm now with American Pacific. I'm the president <clears throat> and essentially the chief geologist of, of the company. So I, I do the drill planning and things, but I keep my, my finger on the pulse of, of, of minerals because they really do affect my life, my community's life. I live in Elko, Nevada, so I'm kind of in mining central, uh, but I've, I've been in the business for, business for quite, a, quite a long time. Thank you, Eric. And Matt? Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. My name is Matt McKenzie. I'm the Vice President of Midnight Sun Mining Corp. We've uh, been in Zambia uh, working on a copper project since 2013, where we acquired an option on it at that time after extensive due diligence. Previous to that, I was with Roxgold when we made the Yaramoko discovery in Burkina Faso, uh, which is now in production. Uh, and Roxgold recently combined with Fortuna Silver, a large transaction. And uh, prior to that, I was with BMO and their Capital Markets Group. Thank you, Matt. Um, now, we've got a, a breadth of experience and different opinions and um, different positions in the industry here on the panel today. So we're going to have, a, I think, a very diverse and stimulating conversation. But to kick things off, um, I'd like to take advantage of the fact we've got Stefan, one of the, the more, most recognized uh, analysts on the street with us. Um, Stefan, can you sort of give us uh, your overview of, of the copper market at the current time and what, what's happening, please? 
Sure. Yeah. Happy to. Um, yeah, really, you know, what really is compelling to me about copper is obviously exciting right now, you know, 425 level testing upwards of 480 earlier this year. Uh, but really what really gets me excited is the medium to longer term outlook. Uh, and really copper, it's not just a copper story. It's really an all base metal story. Copper is a great proxy, though, similar themes across the whole sector of base metals. And, uh, you know, what really stands out to me is when you look at sort of the recent new supply that's come on, that really stands to keep the market in give or take supply demand balance through, you know, call it 2023, 2024. But when we get beyond that, uh, we really start to see a, a significant supply gap emerging. And, uh, and we look at this, so call it the next generation of new projects that come in to, to, to continue to fill that gap. They have fallen way behind just on a lack, lack of capital spending over the last, you know, call it 10 years. And, uh, and I think it's really shaping up for a significant supply deficit as we move through the late 2020s and into the 2030s. And obviously layering on top of that, the whole idea of electrification and green energy, uh, that just stands to make that deficit even bigger. Um, so, you know, when I, when I sort of think about copper and where it is right now, you know, I, I would argue, you know, current floor pricing is very much producer dictated. And we look at the established producers out there right now. We saw a few years ago when copper prices dipped, you know, a lot of big established producers did start to have problems that call it sub 250 a pound copper. Um, and, uh, and I think even to this day, you could argue that, you know, to keep a, a, a meaningful amount of existing production uh, on the table, you need bare minimum 250 to 275 a pound copper in today's market. Where it gets interesting, though, is when I look at the, the list of the next generation of projects, they are inherently, you know, they're big projects, but they are in, in mining lower and lower grades. And because of that, the incentive pricing to get those next generation projects off the ground is probably something on the order of 350 a pound copper. And so, uh, you know, I, th I think that's a very interesting sort of thesis for just, you know, underlying uh, minimum floor pricing. Uh, and then if we take it to the sort of one step further and think about, well, what about the ceiling price aspects of it? And I think that's really when the whole idea of carbonomics sort of steps in and the incremental new demand coming from, from new industries, namely, you know, electrification and green energy. So, you know, I think bottom line, something's going to have to give here and it's going to start with the copper price itself. And, you know, just one interesting number is you look, you know, back in 2019, the 10-year forward-looking supply deficit was was pegged at about 4.2 million tons a year in copper. And that's on, a, you know, I call it a 24 million ton a year market. And we look at the same number today, 10 years forward, now the supply deficit is, is, is forecast about 8.2 million tons. So basically doubled uh, in the matter of two years. So again, something is, is, is coming down the pipeline. Um, not good from a, a supply point of view, but very good for a copper pricing point of view. Um, that's all medium to longer term. Obviously, the short term is where we are today. And what does that mean? And I, I do anticipate that, you know, there'll be some volatility here over the next uh, months and, and maybe year or two. Uh, and really, you know, we've seen a lot of sort of um, uh, stimulus come out of China on the back of COVID uh, and, and stagnant supply out of the mines given COVID considerations. Uh, but again, one of the big drivers of, of the copper bull thesis is this whole electrification. And, you know, I, th I think it's important to recognize that the EV revolution is still in its relative infancy. And I think it's not until we get out, say, four or five years before we really start to see fundamental supply, you know, in terms of you and I going out and buying electric cars and the whole bit. So I, I think, you know, while I think copper prices are going to remain relatively strong compared to historic levels, um, I think it's, it's not until we get out to the later part of this decade that we really see that idea of, of you know, really strong for longer copper going forward. And, you know, put out there, Goldman Sachs is out there with a long-term copper price of 680 a pound and Wood Mac, you know, pegs incentive pricing in the future at around 550 a pound. So some big numbers out there there. And obviously, if you're in production, or even if you have a development project, even a low grade one, they all stand to look very strong economically at those levels. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, Carbonotics, it's the first time I've heard that phrase. Uh, quite a nice one there. Um, let's get into our Q&A. Let, let's stick on the, the subject of prices. Um, the copper's down about, let's say, 10% from its, its highs it reached earlier this year, but still significantly above $4 a pound. So historically speaking, still very healthy. Um, how you, you mentioned a couple of figures there from some of the banks and whatever. How high can copper go and, and how, how quickly do you think? And Stefan, let, let's start with you there. Uh, yeah, again, I mean, I, I think it, it, over the, the short term, I think the general, I, when I look at analyst consensus, for example, and I think where I see a lot of technical reports, feasibilities and, and things, been, and we're seeing the long-term copper price behind those models and studies creep up. 
you know, it used to be that, you know, 275 was kind of the, the benchmark number for a long-term price. And I think now the idea that 325, if not even 350, uh, is, is very reasonable. Um, and again, I think that's, if anything, could, should be viewed as a very conservative number. Obviously, if a, if a project's going to work at 350 pound copper, that should hopefully shield you from a low pricing environment in the future, what would be a low pricing environment. Uh, but again, like I said earlier, uh, I think as we move towards 2030, I think I, I agree. The idea of five dollar plus copper is is not crazy by any means, and and there's a lot of fundamentals to support that. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Um, Alex, so let, let's bring you in here. Uh, obviously, as a royalty company, you do a lot of calculations and forward price estimates and things like that um, to help you decide your investment case for this asset or that asset. How, how do you see the the copper price? playing out and in what kind of time horizon? I mean, do you, do you agree with Stefan's sort of $5 per pound being very reasonable in the not too distant future? Well, to be honest, we haven't even figured out what it should be. Um, I mean, when you look at how hard it is to build a big copper mine, you know, you're talking billions of investment, years of commitment, even for like a major company, it's a massive, massive commitment. This is like the one thing they can do for, you know, four or five, six year time frame, And, you know, it requires a huge capital requirement. Um, I don't think 350 is no, no anywhere near enough for anyone to think about building anything. I'm not sure if $5 is enough for anyone to think about building anything. I mean, so when you look at the big companies right now, they're doing absolutely nothing. I mean, that, that that's probably the best assessment. You know, everyone's paying yeah, dividends. Uh, and so- I, I would just add too that, uh, you know, you can't just turn a switch. So so I agree with, uh, with the incentive pricing of, you know, let's say it's 375 or $4 long-term, but um, uh, to turn those mines on, to turn a, a brand new mine on uh, that, you know, has gone through, uh, you know, the, the late stages of, develop, of feasibility, uh, you're still talking uh, four to eight years, you know, to get new production. So, so the, the, the copper price is going to be dictated by the, the time lag, you know, to bring on new projects, uh, number one. Uh, and then number two, just identifying those, the, you know, the, the next round of projects that will will be developed um, and and that's where uh, Camino is on the exploration side we think that this is very much this next cycle is very much an exploration story well th that was going to be sort of my sort of follow-up question you know I think Stefan mentioned that uh, the incentive price is let's say three dollars fifty a pound but we've been well above that for six to nine months now and and as, as Alex pointed out nothing's happened so um, how realistic is that as an incentive price um, Eric um, you know you're an explorer um, what, what do you think about what the incentive price should be and let's put it into exploration terms what kind of price would you be looking to have in an economic study um, and how do you judge that now well it's it's, it's tough right now as I mentioned earlier uh, the, the, the majority of the copper is coming out of some very, very mature mines. So the production costs are going to dictate, I think, your, your basement price or your, your floor price. And I think that's going to stick around three bucks in my mind. I think you could possibly make it. I mean, people were making money two years ago at $2.50 copper. So you can do it, but your margins are going to be very, very tight. Uh, I, I think in the future, we're going to be dealing with... Uh, I really, really don't see any big mines coming on. Everyone's bringing up excellent points. It's very tough to get a, a big mine going. Plus, it's hard to find one in places like Mongolia and other. Have, they've just priced themselves and taxed themselves out of existence. So a lot of the places in the world that have world class copper deposits are, are just not going to come online. It's going to take a long time to get them online. It's going to take a total ge uh, just a geologic shift, uh, or a, as I should say a a geopolitical shift in, in getting these things online. So you're going to have continued production from Bingham Canyon, from Chukicamata, from Escondido. You're going to have that kind of thing, but that's just going to drive the prices up. So it's a, it's a balance right now of supply and demand, Just and copper is the perfect example of that. So I see $5 copper in the next six months, and I see $325 in the next year. I think it's just going to go up and down. The housing bubble in the United States right now is going to pop. And when that does, copper is going to respond in kind. It's going to drop 15 or 20 percent. So you just have to kind of to gauge uh, the market a bit. But I think right now it's on an upward swing. It, it should, should be five bucks within six months. OK, Jay, I'll, I'll bring you. Sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, the, the other point I want to make is, I mean, let's just go back in history. Uh, you know, to 2001 when we were in another, you know, copper cycle there and it was driven primarily by, uh, you know, the Chinese economy. Um, 
<clears throat> you know, copper started that, uh, that decade at, you know, under a dollar around 60 cents. And when it finished in 2011, it was, I think it hit a high of over $4.50, $4 $4.60. So that was a six time increase, you know, in, in pricing. And, you know, you pick, pick the starting uh, price point uh, in, in this cycle, um, but it won't surprise me to see that type of price rise for all the reasons that we're saying here. Uh, and we haven't even included the, the additional costs of ESG requirements and everything else, you know, uh, in, in the future, future market. So, um, so I, I'm, you know, this is why we're uh, in, in the copper space and, and we're, you know, we're in a position where um, we're trying to acquire as much as, as many of the, the good assets uh, as we can, um, you know, ahead of, uh, of what we think is going to be a very robust uh, copper price and copper market. Well, how high can copper go is a you know a big question. There's so many factors that go into that that it's you know impossible to crystal ball an exact time phase. You read all of the analyst reports and get your hands on, and the consensus is it's an upward trajectory. Whether that's you know immediate term, intermediate term, long term, it's all going the same direction. You know, supply demand is what it is. Uh, and you make forecasts about continued electrification, and uh, I'm hard pressed to disagree with the electrification and the continued need for copper going forward. Uh, we're just going to see, you know, uh, larger and larger. And, and the nice thing about uh, copper, as opposed to the other sort of quote unquote battery metals, is you know other things. Uh, the chemistry for industrial batteries, for example, is still getting fine tuned and worked on. And what is that ultimately going to look like? Uh, 10 years from now, it's hard to say, but the demand for copper to support all that electrification, uh, that's gonna remain and, and that's not gonna be uh, supplanted by any other metal anytime soon. So the case for copper is very strong. And I think that's the, the key feature, whether it's $5 copper, $15 copper, somewhere in between, it's a strong place to be. Uh, and as an exploration company, that's, really what uh, what I want to be looking at. Um, so I think we're in the right place for that. Um, the other thing about copper is uh, you've got the macro uh, elements that are so hard to forecast. Um, you know, election cycles around the world in copper producing companies and then in major manufacturing economies and copper using economies, things like that that can you know, create uh, you know, upward bubbles, downward pressure. And these are simply things that you know, sitting here today can't predict, but I just have to maintain the confidence that copper is going in one direction ultimately, and that's up. Stefan mentioned uh, carbonomics, decarbonization of the sort of global economy and transportation system. And uh, that's obviously forecast to have a, a big impact, positive impact. On, on copper, and as Stefan mentioned, uh, a growing supply deficit from, I think you said, 2024 onwards. Um, so you know, what kind of impact will that have on, on copper exploration companies such as uh, Camino and, and American Pacific? Do you, do you foresee a situation where you can have the downstream buying into the junior coppers to ensure they've got uh, first dibs on supply in a similar way as has happened in the lithium space? Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's a number of, uh, of, of topics there. Um, you know, first of all, uh, when you see these copper price moves, uh, the first companies to move are the, uh, the large, you know, uh, uh, producers. Uh, and we've seen that uh, so far in the marketplace. Uh, we haven't seen that yet uh, uh, in the exploration space. And that comes sort of, you know, next uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the cycle. And um, so... You know, so so the market will start to recognize uh, the junior companies uh, as being, uh, you know, some of the best places to to invest uh, ahead of a copper cycle, because uh, they're really the groups uh, that will identify, you know, these new uh, opportunities, uh, you know, for for copper production uh, along this timeline that Stefan is saying, you know, in the next uh, in the next uh, five to ten years. Um, having said that. New discoveries, you know, the the value of those discoveries uh, is recognized immediately, you know, at the drill tip. Uh, once uh, once a new uh, uh, you know drill program uh, identifies uh, uh, something uh, uh, that you know that that, that is recognized uh, as a discovery, um, 
yeah, in terms of uh, uh, decarbonization, uh, you know, the, the copper market is going to have to, uh, you know, supply that. I, I look at copper as the enabling metal for carbonization or decarbonization, uh, and uh, and you know, it's 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 a metal that uh, connects uh, renewable energy, which is whether you're producing from from wind or solar, uh, to the grid, and finally uh, into you know the uh, electric car and, and electric transportation. So copper is the enab enabling metal. Um, and as a copper producer or copper developer or copper explorer, uh, we will also have to uh, build our businesses uh, along this decarbonization, um, you know, pl platform. Uh, and you're seeing that uh, in the copper industry, especially with the major producers, you know, groups like, uh, um, you know, BHP uh, are now uh, developing, um, you know, renewable energy sources uh, for their projects like Spence and, uh, um, and Escondida, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're, they're developing, uh, you know, uh, uh, seawater pipeline systems, uh, you know, uh, from, you know, from taking water now from uh, the, uh, the um, uh, from the ocean uh, to an elevation of 3000 meters. Uh, they're making those sort of ESG uh, type decarbonization uh, investments. And uh, so, you know, the copper industry is going to uh, basically uh, be providing the metal uh, for decarb decarbonization, but it's also going to be uh, uh, decarbonizing uh, our, our production as well. As an exploration company, the price of copper today, tomorrow, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, the reason for that is I want to think like a major. What does a major want to see? And they're not looking at you know, the price tomorrow. I'm uh, sure the, the trading arm and the sales and that are, but uh, their exploration side, their commercial side, you know, looking at making acquisitions, they've got a long-term time horizon. They want a uh, 30-year plus mine life. So you know, I have to take that, that I, I want a big deposit. Um, whether you know it's five dollar copper tomorrow, four twenty five today, three dollars next year. Um, you know the the major copper companies want material, they want feed, they they want projects that are their size and scale. So, you know, I, I try and take the same mindset when I'm looking looking at projects, analyzing projects, um, like the one we have at Midnight Sun. We recognize the size and scale is there to appeal to a major. And that's our ultimate goal as an explorer is find the something that a major will be mining. So, you know, the relevancy of, of the copper price today is uh, you know, less so for where we sit. Where it does have an effect uh, is you know, the ability to raise funds. If there's more, you know, attraction to the copper market, more froth going on, you know, from uh, retail investors. There's more articles about the future of copper that's positive and more analyst reports supporting uh, the upward price trend. Well, great, you know, we'll get uh, immediate value bumps in our you know, stock price and our ability to access and raise funds, things like that. But again, it's uh, for us, we're trying to play a, a longer term game here and identifying something that appeals to a major that's going to last through multiple copper cycles and these mines get to be that size so we want to find a generational mine that lasts multiple copper cycles and that's really the beauty of, of exploring in the copper industry in the base metal industry is you get these truly generational mines that uh, do come along yeah it's easier said than done to find them but they exist, they get found, they come online. And yeah, of course, there's a, a time delay and a time lag in uh, getting those up and built. But you look at something like uh, you know, Kamoa Kakula and the DRC, um, you know, they can be found and developed in a you know, pretty tight time frame, and the payoff is there for investors. Um, so that's you know, that's what we are, are after and what we're trying to do. And uh, you know, why we've partnered up with Rio Tinto in, in Zambia is uh, we believe we can we can find the next uh, world-class mine that appeals to them and will last through multiple copper cycles, multiple multiple base metal cycles, multiple mining cycles. Uh, so the, the prizes are are well worth it ultimately. I'd like to bring in Eric here. Um, you know, same question. Uh, 
do, do, you know, you've obviously got a relationship with Rio Tinto, one of the major copper suppliers. So um, you're, you're, you're seeing sort of bigger companies coming into, into the exploration companies. Um, how, how far do you think, how, how deep do you think that will go? Well, I, I actually, I, I think that companies like Rio and just, it's based upon where your properties are. If you're in, you know, 40 miles south of Butte, Montana, which was a heck of a deposit. And we all know about that one, the Anaconda um, mine for mine for years and years. You're going to see an influx and you're going to see, uh, I believe, the bigger companies taking a bigger risk rather than inheriting properties that are uh, that have a resource or that are well drilled. They're going to start using more of the scientific approach to it to get in early stage because down the road, 15 years, there's not a hole in the lot in the pipeline. These, these companies are, they're mining big giant pits and they've been mining these big giant pits for as long as you and I've been alive. So there, there needs to be some new influx of copper, uh, not just recycling, but it's going to be, uh, a, it's going to be a metal that's never going to be replaced. Aluminum's going to come along too, is, is a, I think a lead lag. I think you'll see aluminum, any conductive metal is going to come along here relatively quickly. Uh, but, but right now, the big companies are, are they are starting to go into the smaller companies just to take a chance on things they can get in cheap they can spend the money as as you know judiciously as they want there's no real expectations except down the line 10 or 15 years but these big companies are thinking 10 15 years down the road thank you eric um interesting comment you made about uh, a re, perhaps a refocus on north america um and to sort of a bit more context around that Latin America is a, a copper production powerhouse, but um, the, the ability to increase production from there is sort of taken a knock in the last year or so, given that the governments in Chile and Peru uh, looking to potentially raise taxes and maybe even state participation, which uh, raises questions and perhaps doubts over the future investment climate in those countries. If the government date does increase significantly in those countries, how will that impact the broader world of copper investment? And Alex, let me direct this one to you first. Um, you obviously look at a lot of projects. Um, is the potential for uh, increased government take in Peru and Chile, is that changing your, your analytical model and how, you're, how favorably or not you look at things? Um, I think, listen, there's obviously been enough press on this. Uh, the view we've taken it so far is, listen, these two countries together, account for over 40% of global copper production. That's a much higher percentage in copper than OPEC controls in oil. <laughs> so just for perspective's sake. So th this isn't the place where something changes quickly. You know, when people talk about new investment in other countries, I mean, the time frame for exploration to production in a new copper mine is 30 to 40 years. So, you know, as much as you need to understand what the governments are doing, you also have real logistical issues and and actually acting on those changes in any kind of reasonable time frame. And, and so I think that look, these are established jurisdictions, they're gonna to come to some sort of new regime. I think most people at this point expect that there will be a higher share going to the government in terms of uh, the economic benefits. I think, to be honest, that was expected. If you looked at what happened with COVID, you know, we here in the US and Canada have been insulated, you know, really from the worst of it. If you ever spend any time in Latin America, it's a completely different world. So. Um, I think the biggest question everyone has is the extent of the changes. And so, yes, if, if the results are sort of significant enough in terms of deviation, you will see people looking at other countries. Um, but at this page, I mean, just the way we see it, I think the odds are against anything fundamental happening, because I think these countries also depend significantly on, on the mining industry. So my guess is that something gets, gets worked out, which is, which is relatively acceptable. I mean, when you look at size in copper, you need size. You know the really big deposits are going to are sitting in that Latin American triangle. You know Chile, Chile, Peru, Argentina, and Ecuador now as well. And if you go to North America, U.S. has a few. Canada doesn't have anything of size. Australia doesn't have anything of size. So, so the geology also forces you to look at that part of the world very seriously. So it's not as simple as just saying we're going to go somewhere else. Um, so I think I, I think that you know kind of time will bear out. Um, exactly what it looks like. And uh, I suppose that'll be another factor underpinning a higher floor price in, in copper. Oh, absolutely. I mean, listen, I, I it, this industry is so difficult. I mean, I give tremendous credit to all the management teams out there, um, kind of at whatever, whatever stage of uh, you know, exploration, development, production they're at, because 
this is it's so enormously difficult to have a viable deposit that actually advances uh, towards something real. And now it's only getting harder because and, uh, kind of you have ESG, you have government, you have social relations. Um, it, it never it never gets easier. So yeah, it, it's difficult to see the the floor price dropping here. I think I think the direction is pretty clear. Well, well, that's a good takeaway from the. If there's only one takeaway from this uh, this webinar, uh, that's a good one. Um, um, Jay, let me bring you in. Um, you obviously operate in uh, in in South America, in Peru. Well, what's your take on how things are developing there? Yeah, well, I mean, look, I mean, uh, you know, ahead of a copper cycle, you've got to go where the copper is. And, uh, and Chile and Peru clearly are the dominant uh, copper producers in the world. Uh, and it's because that's where the geology is. You know, um, we talk about size, uh, uh, but you have to look at grade as well. So grade and tonnage, um, you know, if you look at the last cycle, uh, I mean, that was Las Bambas, Constancia, uh, uh, you know, a few others out of Peru, uh, Kayaveco is being built now, uh, Mina Husta is being built uh, right next to us. I mean, these are all the newest uh, copper mines being built, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a flat copper copper market. Um, uh, and, you know, we still believe uh, that uh, in, you know, parts of Peru are still very vastly underexplored, which is where our focus is. Uh, um, and that there is potential and that we think we have uh, geological systems uh, that will hold in any market, up, uh, up market or down market, um, because they're big, they're big geological systems that uh, can host uh, large, large new deposits, uh, which obviously is value enhancing for Camino. Uh, but we do believe that these are systems that would be value enhancing for the copper market as a whole to make a discovery on these projects. Thank you, Jay. Um, I want to stick with you for the next question. Um, you know. Copper market's going very well, um, but it tends to sort of take time to trickle down to the junior explorers. So what is the kind of message you're receiving from the investment community? Um, and if it's positive, is the money there to back that up, to enable you to, to raise the money, to do the work you need to do, the many years of work you need to do to bring a discovery through to becoming a deposit and perhaps into development at some point in the future? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the investment uh, climate still has to, as you say, trickle down to the juniors. Um, we've been able to raise capital. We're well funded to do drill programs uh, uh, this year on, on two of our, our main projects, which is Los Chapitos and Maria Cecilia. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I mean, we're building a portfolio. So we just closed a transaction uh, with Denim Capital uh, in the last uh, quarter. Um, to bring on yet another large geological system, which is uh, the Maria Cecilia uh, Porphyry system um, in Ancash, uh, Peru. Um, so uh, it, 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 it's always hard uh, to raise money. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, in the mining sector, uh, uh, and um, but we've managed to find good shareholders, uh, uh, institutions in particular that have supported us. Uh, for this round of, of financing and can certainly follow uh, in future rounds. Uh, and their focus is on, uh, you know, new projects, new discoveries. Uh, for the reasons we mentioned earlier, they think that the market, uh, the copper market uh, going forward is, is all about uh, new discoveries and taking exploration assets uh, to, to, through to development and production. I've been working on this project since 2013. You know, we've received uh, a lot of, you know, I don't say, negativity, that's not the right word, but, you know, pessimism from the investment community about base metals um, for a number of the number of those years, but we've really seen that uh, uh, switched around of late. You're always going to have your gold bugs and your silver bugs and things like that in the investment space. And, um, you know, I, I don't argue with them uh, having their beliefs whatsoever, but I think the mainstream belief amongst investment in the investment community about copper and base metals and the bright future for those uh, is uh, just continuing on the upswing. And you're going to get more and more uh, investors looking for places to access uh, you know, exposure that's still undervalued. And exploration is ultimately going to be the place for them. Uh, I think we're going to see you know, some pretty deservedly strong valuations for the major copper producers. So, you know, investors looking for a little bit of uh, a bigger payback are going to come downstream and look for explorers who, you know, ideally are going to identify and um, 
discover the next, the next big copper mines in the world. And they're there and there's gonna be a lot of global pressure to find them. So I think that investors are just now sort of sitting up, taking note that, okay, there's not a ton of high quality exploration plays out there. So they're starting to sift through and, and look for them and identify them. And uh, you know, we're gonna see the valuations re responding you know, uh, throughout the market to copper plays. And that, that's exciting. Uh, exciting time after uh, a fairly long haul where you know copper exploration companies were few and far between and in part because it was very tough to access funding for those so it's nice to see the pendulum swing the other way now and uh, I think the investment thesis of copper and base metal exploration is very strong and uh, the word of that will just continue to spread Eric, uh, same question for you. Um, what, what's the kind of message you're getting from, from investors and are you be, uh, getting access to the funds that you need? We have uh, been opportunistic and we have been somewhat lucky in the last two years. We have raised money when we needed it. Uh, we're well funded right now, but it comes in waves. In the junior market, uh, it, it, literally within two or three months, you can go from, woo, we can get some money and you get checks coming in from investors to, oh my goodness, we need to cut our salaries in half. So it's, it's, it, it has been good. Uh, the last 18 months have been up and down, but uh, the money is coming in from the big companies and working for Newmont as long as I did, uh, I was a, a part of the big company that was investing in the smaller company. Now I'm in a smaller company and expecting some investment trickling down, but it is getting there for all the reasons we've been talking is that we're, we have the boots on the ground and sometimes we do have really nice projects and as long as you market them well and you actually have some substance to it, the money will come in. Excellent. Um, Stefan, I'd like to bring you in on this question. You obviously work for one of the investment banks, and uh, so you've got a pretty good overview of the, the, the financial sector in general. Well, what's the sort of message you're hearing in, in the meetings that you have? Um, obviously, ex investing in exploration, copper exploration, long timelines. Not all investors are patient enough for that sort of five to 10 or 15 year window. What, what's the kind of messaging you're hearing? Yeah, and I think that's part of the challenge. I, I'd say overall, it's, it, there's been a positive swing. You know, I think anyone entering this year, the idea that copper was going to be, you know, averaging 425 plus a pound through the first half of the year uh, would have would have sort of thought you might, might be crazy or a bit, a bit aggressive. And, and lo and behold, here we are. And that's brought a lot of new eyes into the space. And what's really nice to see is, that I'd say for the first time in a number of years, uh, the market is now paying attention to and paying for, you know, good exploration stories and, and good discoveries. Um, so, so there is money available finally for these companies. You know, again, a few years ago, even if you had a great project, you had a great drill hole, it more often than not, unfortunately, fell on deaf ears. So, so there is a there is a attention now to the space. I'd say the one challenge, um, and you know, again, it really comes down to who the investors are. I think some of the institutional investors uh, are in a good position in that they tend to have a slightly longer time horizon. And, and again, they're looking to out a couple of years and, and recognize what we talked about earlier about, you know, the, the, the growth outlook for the copper price. Um, unfortunately, you know, we saw a copper hit an all time high of kind of a 480 back in May. It's since fallen to, you know, 425 and I kind of say it's only 425 it's still a fantastic price but nevertheless it's it's come down and that that downward momentum has spooked some of the more sort of uh in and out quote unquote retail investors from the space which again there's always going to be that volatility uh but that again that stands or has has so far sort of you know kept things at bay to a certain extent but I think long-term investors realize that the, the, the copper price is going to be a lot stronger going forward and are willing to start start to bet on exploration development projects now more so than they did a couple of years back. Thank you. I think it's uh, incredible how, how quickly we become accustomed to copper prices over $4. And when it dips down a little bit, we go, oh, no, it's a disaster. Yeah. Um, and within a broader context there, some of the big diversified miners have been posting record profits and record dividends. So it's, it's a very healthy time for, for the producers. Um, now, we, we've talked a bit about sort of Chile and Peru, but uh, um, with high prices and perhaps political risk increasing in Chile and Peru or country risk, um, what, what other jurisdictions are starting to come back Onto the onto the map in terms of uh, copper exploration. What, what what do you see there, Stefan? Uh, well, I, I think you know it's it's still 
you know, political risk is still front and, and center. And I think if anything, it, it's gained sort of even additional attention with the whole idea of VSG and sustainability. Um, you know, just on the Peru and Chile thing, I think one thing to recognize is from an economic point of view, those those you know those countries are being viewed as riskier now with you know the the the, the potential for higher taxes and royalties. But from a social license point of view, they're still considered you know. Uh, fairly high stature mining jurisdictions to be in and safe jurisdictions. Uh, and again, like a number of the other speakers have mentioned, you know, that's where the copper is. So if you're looking for big copper projects, again, Mother Nature doesn't pick the the, the po politics where it puts the deposits. So you kind of have to go there first and, and deal with everything else after. But in terms of other countries, again, I think ESG has really come to the forefront uh, as, as a very key metric for investors looking to invest in companies. And, and the way I look at it is sort of the new trifecta of, you know, what makes a good project a good project. And, you know, and back in the day, it was all about grade tonnage, you know, plus or minus infrastructure. And I think now, you know, it really comes down to, you know, things like a, a low carbon footprint, you know, being in a favorable jurisdiction and also having a project and maybe focus on a metal that's of strategic importance, something, you know, a project that can offer, you know, scalability or, 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 or sorry, um, um, certainty of, of production over long periods of time. Okay, I'll bring in Eric there. I mean, you obviously sort of focused in North America. So um, are you benefiting from that, you know, perhaps perception of uh, it's a more stable jurisdiction, less likely to have uh, dramatic changes? Uh, and also let's bring in uh, Stefan's points about the ESG aspects and sort of low carbon footprint. Is that something you get quizzed about just as much as what the potential grade is or what the potential sizes of your, of your project? Not, not really. The ESG is not doesn't come into into the, the conversation that much, at least right now. Obviously, we're an exploration company, so we're years away from any kind of, of uh, production. Uh, but yeah, that uh, in, in the United States, I think it's a little less acute, at least right now. Uh, but down the road, for sure, you're going to be dealing with with uh, those 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 types of issues. Uh, we do our best, uh, obviously, as an exploration group to. To minimize our impact on everything, but uh, we still realize we have diesel drills and other things that we've got to we've got to use until the technology switches switches that out maybe in ten or fifteen years. But I, I haven't seen any real pinch when it comes to permitting, and I haven't seen any real the COVID thing really gave us a a, a bunch of cramps for the last eighteen months. But other than that, I, I think things are, are are pretty fluid, and I just think that obviously. Chile and Peru, and I worked in both uh, countries 20 years ago uh, for Newmont, Th those are where the big deposits are. It's just, I think people feel at risk 15 years down the road, and they would prefer to be someplace like the United States or North America anyway, uh, that, that, that offers them some security, at least false or, or real, who knows exactly, but you know, down, down the road, but that's where they want to be. So you do see a lot of money coming in from Rio into the United States right now for uh, projects that, that were not very advanced. In, in, 10 years ago, they probably wouldn't even be touching some of the projects I know that they're drilling because they're taking a risk to stay in the U.S. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. And um, you also mentioned sort of technology. So I'd like to sort of bring that into the conversation. Um, I think a couple of you mentioned, you know, declining grades. It's, uh, it's uh, one of the certainties in the industry, you know, mining grade, grades decline. Uh, and so mines today are producing at much lower grades than even sort of 10 years ago during the last uh, copper cycle. Um, and with the added factor of sort of decarbonization, the, the decarbonization of mining coming in now as well, um, what, what sort of new technologies um, are you hearing about or seeing on the horizon that can help, um, you know, reduce costs, make mines more productive and potentially reducing carbon footprint in the future and indeed for exploration as well. Um, let, let's start with Alex. I mean, again, you, you have a broad overview um, of the sector. What's, where are you sort of seeing advances look, potentially being made? Oh, listen, I think this is something that's of keen interest uh, to the whole sector. I mean, I think the, 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 there's multiple things the industry has to figure out, I think. Given the difficulty in building new mines, I think people are also trying to extend the life of the old mines. So, so there's multiple technologies out there right now that helps you process previously unminable material. Um, and I think that's definitely become a big focus for people. Then there's then then there's issues of tailings, there's issues of arsenic. So in, I mean, the thing is, you know, mining, you know, it's it, it's a sector which is essential, but it, it clearly also has a footprint. 
So um, anything, anything that we can do to reduce the footprint of the sector, whether that's desalination technologies, whether that's processing old dumps um, in large mines, which are previously uneconomic. Um, so all of that, I think, is these are really critical initiatives um, you know, kind of for the industry to undertake, for sure. Thank you. Jay, let's follow up with you. Um, you know, Alex used the term footprint and uh, the environmental footprint of a project can be a flashpoint for communities. Peru is one of the countries where that has happened in the past. Um, how, how do you see this or, as you advance your projects? What, what kind of steps are you taking to sort of manage footprint and to be able to communicate that? To your sort of host communities that look, hey, this is going to have a manageable footprint, or the, the impacts are going to be minimized, mitigated. That kind of conversation. Yeah, so so we're starting, you know, uh, in an exploration capacity, but ultimately um, we have a vision for development and, and production. Uh, and uh, and I've taken projects uh, through uh, through all, you know all of the cycles uh, historically. So when I look at a project uh, like our flagship, uh, Los Chapitos. Um, we, you know, acquired the, the, the project, uh, got involved with the company uh, because we like the jurisdiction uh, that it's in. It's uh, near the ocean, uh, it's 15 kilometers off the ocean, so uh, we envision using seawater processing. Um, it is about 100 kilometers uh, away from Peru's largest wind farm, which is Marcona. So we expect, uh, the, and there's a there's a, there's a, a grid that uh, goes over our uh, our property that that connects uh, with that um, wind farm. So from that standpoint, we expect uh, to develop that project uh, with state of the art, uh, you know, um, uh, energy sources uh, and um, and processing. Uh, and we're not really um, new to this because it's a project uh, north of us, uh, Mina Gusta, which is a 1.6 billion dollar investment. Uh, and they're doing this, uh, you know, they're using seawater process, they're using, uh, they're, they're tapped into uh, the grid. Um, so, when, you know, as an exploration company, we, we do envision uh, developing these projects uh, with, um, with state-of-the-art technology. Um, but uh, we, we, we have, you know, uh, started uh, an ESG strategy, even at the early stage that we are uh, in the development cycle. Um, we've connected with uh, a group called Digby out of the UK, which has an ESG platform. Uh, and that is sponsored by major institutions like BlackRock and Dundee and uh, BMO uh, Capital Markets. Um, and you know, the thesis there is that there is uh, billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, of investment that can find its way into what are considered sustainable, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the energy transition. Uh, and mining should be included in that. Uh, mining should be included because we have the enabling metal, which is copper, uh, to make all of that happen, uh, including lithium and cobalt and, and these other, you know, what we call electric metals. So uh, as a strategy, as a corporate strategy, Camino uh, is adopting an ESG strategy at this early stage, at the ex expiration stage. But what it does is it gives us a guideline in terms of what we're doing right and, and where we're deficient. And it compares us, you know, to what we're doing in Peru to everywhere else in the world. You know, what's happening in Africa, Australia, Canada, the United States. And so we can benchmark uh, our strategy and, and we look at it as, uh, as the right thing to do. It, it helps me manage the company, uh, but it also, it, it gives us an advantage in terms of our business development because uh, we think we're one leg ahead uh, in terms of um, acquiring new projects and having you know, this, this platform, which um, ultimately, as we grow our company through uh, development and production, or we get acquired uh, by you know, these the larger companies, um, they're, gonna, they're gonna require uh, the, you know, this ESG, um, uh, you know, execution. And, and, and that's what Camino is, is focused on. It's, it's one of our operating strategies. I think new technologies in the mining and exploration space, uh, you know, I think it's, it, it's where the, our industry's got to go. I think the focus on ESG really goes hand in hand with, uh, technology. I think that's, uh, uh, the, the space where we can have the largest breakthroughs and some pretty large impacts um, on how we operate and how we work. Of course, things like um, you know, the use of seawater with uh, BHP and Antifagasta, things like that are great steps. You know, preserving aquifers, um, that's great. And I think the technologies have to be uh, dependent on jurisdictions. What do you need where you're working? Um, and uh, 
you know, when you're in exploration, of course, you know, your exploration budget is uh, so, so important. And uh, you, know, you want to protect that for your shareholders, make sure it's used well. So if you can tie that to uh, more sustainable practices, well, that's, you know, uh, an absolute win-win. Uh, so starting to look at things like uh, more efficient drills uh, that take you know, smaller vehicles to uh, move them in and out. Um, so you have lower footprint there, they're more efficient, you know, running diesel until we can supplant diesel with, you know, solar, wind, who knows uh, what the future could hold. But until then we're stuck with diesel, um, use as little diesel as possible. Great, you know, less than environmental impact, less in cost as well. Um, Things like uh, you know the drills that recirculate water, preserve water, so you're not uh, having to to draw on that resource. So uh, I'm seeing improvements uh, on fronts like that, uh, but I I think we're on the the verge of having a a big big move forward in that space, uh, and I think the focus on ESG is are going to be a big driver of that, and I think that it's going to um, you know, ultimately money talks and I think that money being saved while improving ESG is uh, is really perfect and I think we're gonna gonna see that uh, across the board for our, all levels of exploration development and mining thank you um we're, we're coming towards the end now so um a sort of quick round of final comments and uh, I'll, I'll start with Stefan you know outlook for the next 12 months for for copper what, what's your view there uh, I, I think relatively strong, you know, 420, I, I'd say somewhere between 375 and maybe upwards of 450 on a good day, uh, you know, some some interday or interweek or intermonth volatility through that period. And I think really just sort of show, shoring up a, a firm baseline for that, uh, that sort of stronger for longer, medium to longer term copper price, like we talked about before. So, uh, and again, I, I was even 375 copper. I mean, oh my God, some guys might say the sky is falling. That's still a very strong copper price for established producers today that uh, like we talked about earlier you know the high, uh, we're making money even at 250 copper so yeah excellent alex a key catalyst for for you and nova in the next uh, 12 months well listen i mean we we buy royalties on really some of the largest development projects out there and we're also buying producing royalties now as well i think as the sector develops and you know confidence uh confidence begins to really return to the larger mining companies that's when you'll see capital investment but um i think for us right now you know, we don't think this is something that will happen immediately. I think it's going to take a really strong base um, in, the, in a much higher power price environment. You're going to need to see some clarity on the geopolitical front in Chile and Peru um, and just see how the governments are oriented. I, mean, I, I, I think that what's interesting is, you know, what Stefan is saying about the copper price. I think this, this is your situation before there's any real clarity. Um, but even once you have clarity, it's going to take a, a lot of investment and assurances to get the investment you need from your mind. So um, we're probably looking at a pretty long cycle here. Okay, thank you. Jay, um, catalyst in the next 12 months for, for you and Camino. Yeah, so the best value is at the drill tip uh, for any mining company. Uh, we start drilling next week, which will be the beginning of September uh, on our Los Chapitos uh, copper IOCG project. Uh, and then we'll follow that up uh, later in the fall uh, on our copper porphyry project at Maria Cecilia. So lots of uh, drilling results uh, to come uh, this fall. So we're in real time and, and we expect uh, our momentum uh, to follow. Excellent, thank you. And Eric, a catalyst for you at uh, um, American Pacific over the next 12 months. Well, we have uh, drilling programs, three drilling programs, one silver gold, uh, and other one's just straight gold, the other one's copper uh, copper gold up in, in Montana. So it's gonna be based upon drill results. Uh, the programs are currently being permitted and or or in progress. So it's gonna be the results from the drilling that'll be the catalyst for additional effort uh, by Rio Tinto as they uh, as they move forward with our, our copper project. So it, once again, as Jay said, it's gonna be uh, defined by the drill. I'm very excited for the next 12 months of Midnight Suns development. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I've always believed we're gonna be a, a overnight success that was a long time in the making. Uh, we've got Rio Tinto operating our project right now. 506 square kilometers in Zambia, smack dab to uh, First Quantum's Consanchi mine, uh, the largest copper mine in Africa, uh, just uh, just a little bit south, you know, on uh, the Zambian side of the border from uh, Ivanhoe's Kamoa Kakula, which is ramping up. So we've got 
you know, the, some of the biggest of the bigs uh, right in our neck of the woods. And we believe we can be with them uh, size-wise. We just had an election in Zambia where a uh, pro-mining president was elected. So that's uh, a very exciting, exciting piece. There's a uh, $2 billion worth of expenditures have been announced by a couple of major miners in the region uh, since the election. We're going to see a, a huge boom. And uh, you know, people often associate uh, copper mining with you know, Latin America and you know, rightfully so. There's you know, tremendous production there. But uh, the Central African Congo, uh, Congo and uh, Zambia uh, copper belt, you're right there with you know, Peru as uh, some of the biggest you know, jurisdictions in the world for copper production. And I think that's going to be ramped up here in, in over the next 12 months. So, you know, there's a reason why Rio Tinto uh, is working our property and uh, doing a tremendous amount of drilling. And we have a very large property that uh, you know, is, necessitates a, a lot of drilling. So we're going to be having a lot of work done over the next 12 months, and I'm very excited to see what the results hold. Excellent. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. So I'd like to thank Stefan, Alex, Jay, Eric and Matt for joining us today. And stay tuned to mining-journal.com for more insight panels in the future. Thank you, everybody.